It was six in the morning. I got a knock on my door, a really loud knock, and I thought it was my dad who had locked himself out or something. So I opened it and it's the LED flashlights and the really obnoxious bulletproof vest and the dragging me out into the cold when I'm in my pajamas. That was not fun. They seemed pretty shocked by the sarcastic, belligerent, angry teenager that they dragged out of bed that day. <laughs> I don't know if it's just that I was 19 or that I was a girl, but they didn't expect this. Ten thousand angry kids, whoever they are, they scared the shit out of some people those days. They scared the shit out of the powers that be. And that's why this is being investigated. That's why I'm under indictment. That's it. Because between the days of December 6th and December 10th, 10,000 angry people proved to the government that their regulations, their ideas, their view of PayPal, their view of WikiLeaks, their view of the Afghan war, and Egypt, and Tunisia, and Libya, it didn't fucking matter. Their opinion no longer mattered because someone was out on the internet kicking ass. The computer hacker group Anonymous is claiming tonight that it took down the website of the Federal Appeals Court in San Francisco this afternoon. They took down Senate.gov servers, they've taken down H.B. Gary. Sony's claiming they did $150 million worth of damage. So many confidential files that tonight, because of these hackers, can be in the hands of anyone. Visa, MasterCard, the PayPal situation. The criminals who hacked into Sarah Palin's private email. The Church of Scientology says Anonymous is a cyber terrorist group of religious bigots. Anonymous and this other group called a Lulz Sec. They seem to be wanting to prove a point. Anonymous kind of was like the big, strong, buff kid who had low self-esteem. And then all of a sudden, punched somebody in the face and was like, holy shit, I'm really strong. And Anonymous calls itself the final boss of the internet. And sometimes it proves to be really fucking true. You are going to violate the freedoms of the internet, you certainly better watch the fuck out. They are kind of the rude boys of activism. There's a real rough edge to them, which I think also is one reason why they garner so much love and hate from people, too. They represent a certain sort of chaotic freedom. Individual, young, nameless, faceless folks are having geopolitical impact. I mean, it's, it's, it's both exhilarating to realize that and terrifying to realize that. It kind of depends on how that power is wielded. We are legion. We do not forget. Expect us. We stand for freedom. We stand for freedom of speech, the power of the people, the ability for them to protest against the government, to right wrongs. No censorship, especially online, but also in real life. We have members throughout society and all stratas of it worldwide. Yeah, we have no leadership. It's a one voice. It's, it's not individual voices. That's why we don't show our faces. That's why we don't give our names. We're speaking as one, and it's a collective. Good time. I would love to live in a country where the government fears its citizens and not, and, and not the other way around. But right now, Plenty of anonymous actors are in hiding because of fear of reprisals by the government. I've been called many things. There's unpatriotic. That we're just a bunch of children sitting in some, our parents' basement. I got called a terrorist sympathizer. We've been called kids, we've been called cyber bullies, we've been called hooligans, and... You know, sometimes those words aren't entirely unfair, but this is a serious political movement. No one, you know, in the general public really seems to get it. What they don't seem to get is that the ability for Anonymous to be everything and anything is, is, is its power. 
Anonymous is a series of relationships, hundreds and hundreds of people uh, who are very active in it and who have varying skill sets and who have varying issues they want to advance and uh, who are collaborating in different ways each day. They're a little bit like a prism or a kaleidoscope. They've got many different facets and many different sides. Of course, when you spend enough time with them, you start to get a sort of feel or texture um, that's not just random, right? Yet it's very multifaceted, very rich, does, which does span from the quite lighthearted to the very, very serious. Bob Dylan had a line in a song just saying, to live outside the law, you must be honest. They might do something which isn't technically correct, maybe it's not legally correct, but they're doing it for purposes that in their minds at least are, are ethical. People who know what they're doing, who share an ethos, who have a commitment to exposing and humiliating the man, who have a very low tolerance of um, lies and uh, what they perceive as uh, evil on the part of overweening power structures. They share information, they share tools and techniques, and they uh, are currently having a very good time. The hacker culture, as we know it, uh, really sprang from one place. It, it was MIT, and it was uh, uh, specifically the people in the uh, Model Railroad Club, the Tech Model Railroad Club. Hacking originated as humorous pranks. When the guys at MIT put a Volkswagen up on top of the dome of the building, uh, and people woke up and saw the car up there in the morning. Uh, or they uh, measured a bridge by the body lengths of somebody, I would say his name was Brian, and discovered the bridge over the Charles River was, you know, 822 Brian's. Uh, these are funny things. That's where hacking originated, and it migrated into engineering and uh, computer communities. Uh, it's witty, it's pranks. Basically, Microsoft and Apple both got their entire start off computer crime. Bill Gates stole pretty much all of MS-DOS, Steve, you know, Jobs. He was creating boxes to defraud the phone company, you know. I always saw hacking as implicitly political. But hackers, whether they're conscious about it or not, whether they're explicit about it or not, make a statement about how we should treat information. And some years after my, my book came out, uh, one of the people I wrote about, Richard Stallman, got very publicly and explicitly political about open software. About you know, He believed that software should be free. Free as in freedom, not free as in beer, uh, as, as he put it there. Behind it, whether misguided or not, there's a political impulse. Hacktivism was a term coined by a group called Cult of the Dead Cow. The Loft had an interesting relationship with the Cult of the Dead Cow. We've actually, there was three members that were in both organizations. And we kind of kept like the serious security research that they were doing, they would do under the Loft name. And if they were doing some sort of just goofy stunt-like things, they would do it under the Cult of the Dead Cow name. Because the Cult of the Dead Cow was really kind of, um, a, sort of like a propaganda type of organization. They had a guy who was the minister, minister of propaganda. They're kind of merry pranksters. Like everything they did was completely over the top. You know, they would dress up like Mr. T sometimes. They would do rap songs at DEF CON, like a rap performance. One of the guys there, I think his name was T Fish, for short for Tweety Fish, coined the term hacktivism because he saw what his, one of the things his group was doing, which he called hacktivism, was writing software that people in other countries could use to communicate securely, even if their government was spying on them. So the principle was really, it was freedom of expression. It was everyone should have access to the internet, everyone should be able to communicate and get their message out on the internet. Even more important in countries where there was repressive regimes, that if you said something against the regime, they would come and take you away and you weren't saying it anymore. A good place to start are with what has often been called virtual sit-ins which use the tactic of a denial of service attack. Denial of service has been around for a long, long time. The equivalent of like, if you, you know, for some reason wanted to disrupt a, a bus service, right? You can hire a thousand extras to all go and like line up at the bus station, right? And get on the bus. And so then anyone who was really trying to get on the bus couldn't do it, right? It's as simple as that. When you stop trying to visit, website goes back up, no permanent damage. And this tactic has been used by a number of different groups. Um, 
Probably the most famous is the Electronic Disturbance Theater. Another really interesting case happened in Germany where a group of activists got together who wanted to protest the fact that the airline Lufthansa was using, they were using their planes to deport immigrants and they would take down the site. And in fact, eventually the German courts ruled that this was a legitimate form of protest. From airport security to subway bag checks, there's no question it's a new world post 9-11. It's worse now for humans post 9-11, because intrusion and surveillance, which is always going to be misused by those who can misuse it, um, uh, has created a, a different kind of society in which freedom, freedom to move unobserved is a privilege only of the rich. Privacy is a privilege only of the rich. Hackers see the technology giving them sanction to buy that privileged exclusion as well, intrinsic to the technology is the power to uh, self-transcend and get out of the hump of the bell curve and, and move forward to a par with the masters of society and do battle with them on an equal level playing field. That's activism. Anonymous grew out of what's known as 4chan. And essentially this is just a, a website where People can upload images uh, and you don't actually give your name, it's just sort of anonymous. When you look at 4chan, you're often surprised because it looks like a site from like 1995 or something. Um, the idea is very simple, you post a comment and you post a picture. Um, and you can post under your name or, or anonymously. And it's separated into boards about particular topics, so there's a topic on anime, there's a topic on uh, weaponry. There's like a 4chan board for origami and you just upload interesting pictures of origami. And then there was a, a group called the B, the B board, which essentially was for like anything goes. The first time anybody goes on B, it's kind of an instant revulsion, because uh, there's never a time that you go on there where you don't see something horrible. That instantly puts off a lot of people. The idea is post something that can never be unseen. Half of the posts on B are there specifically to make people not want to come back to be. Have you ever read Lord of the Flies? 4chan, and especially B, is Lord of the Flies. Except some of them aren't 16 anymore, they're just allowed to act 16. It's what you get when people are allowed to express themselves with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. It's the kind of sum of human imagination when people can get together and think together without any limits of parameters. It's the most vile, disgusting, and funny thing uh, on the internet. Fortran was founded by Chris Moot Poole when he was very young, maybe 15, in the early 2000s. He started Fortran because he was a big fan of uh, Japanese animation. Christopher Mupool is the sweetest kid you've ever met in your life. He's small and he's like, he's got these sort of like tiny features and he runs the most disgusting website in the world. What I think is really intriguing about a community like 4chan is just that it's, it's this open place. As I said, it's raw, it's unfiltered. And uh, sites like it are, are kind of going the way of the dinosaur right now. They're, they're endangered because we're moving towards uh, social networking. We're moving towards persistent identity. We're moving towards um, you know, a lack of privacy, really. The B board, that's the exact opposite of Facebook. Facebook, like, you're supposed to be, like, who you are, and, you know, there's sort of one model, which is that, like, you're friends with people, right? In 4chan, you're totally anonymous nobody. And anonymous speech is, a lot of it's ugly, but um, not all of it is, right? It is actually sort of a place where people can be honest. One of the important things about 4chan is to have a thread that really explodes and lasts for a long time. If it doesn't, then it disappears. It's a site that's not archived. So it creates conditions for anything that grabs attention at some level. And so humor and grotesqueness as a result are quite good for that. I'd rather just be referred to as anonymous, I guess, in any interviews, because 
I have some docs out on me. Fortune is just where I went to. I grew up on it and I, I lived there. That's just what I did for fun. It takes a thick skin to enjoy it. But, you know, as long as you're not offended, you'll occasionally come into something really cool or really creative on 4chan. I think the most interesting thing about it is how you can watch memes evolve. You'll see something posted one day, and then a week later it's got 50,000 derivatives of it. A meme is basically just an idea. It's kind of like a gene, but in the realm of the idea. A lot of the, the great internet memes that, that we all know and love, you know, uh, lol cats, right? You know, little cats doing funny things, and then they have, you know, uh, I can has cheeseburger, right? All that stuff s seems to start in this like petri dish that is 4chan keyboard. Say it publicly, and your insane chocolate rain. Name uh, any meme from the last about six years, and I'll bet you either in its first posting ever was on 4chan or at least one of its earliest revisions that became what it was, was on 4chan. I can see the food situation is f so we'll be on our way. It's basically the best breeding ground for uh, internet culture, as far as I'm concerned. With your neighborhood insurance rates, top net range. 4chan is also very known for acts of trolling. Trolling is a fucking art. Trolling is getting a, the person you're talking to to get as pissed off as they possibly can and for no reason except for your own enjoyment. Maybe you're trying to illustrate a point, but it's mostly for your own enjoyment. For them, it's, it's funny that like people think the internet is serious business. And if people think the internet is serious business, it's a troll's job to make their life terrible. The idea of anonymous came initially as a joke. I mean, uh, somebody suggested that what if the whole site, what if 4chan, what if B was just one person? And what if that's just one guy called Anonymous sitting somewhere and you're just reading all these posts by one guy? And it kind of looks like that from the outsider's perspective. I mean, there's no way to tell the difference. It might as well be one guy. Fox News did a very famous segment about it. They call themselves Anonymous. They are hackers on steroids, treating the web like a real-life video game sacking websites, invading MySpace accounts, disrupting innocent people's lives. And if you fight back, watch out. Destroy. Die. Attack. Threats from a gang of computer hackers calling themselves Anonymous. I've had seven different passwords and they've got them all so far. Anonymous hacked his site and plastered it with gay sex pictures. His girlfriend left him. She thought that that I was cheating on her with guys. As long as I can think back, Anonymous have done some pretty off-color things in the name of getting cheap laughs, you know. But, I mean, that's part of the culture. They get what they call lulls. Lulls is a corruption of L-O-L, -L, which stands for laugh out loud. Anonymous gets big lulls from pulling random pranks. For example, messing with online children's games like Habbo Hotel. Habbo Hotel was this online community where you had an avatar and you walked around and talked to other people. It was kind of like an early uh, version of, you know, World of Warcraft or Second Life or any of those virtual worlds. What the the people on B did was invade Habbo Hotel, created, you know, thousands of avatars. They they all had this one uniform of a black guy with a big afro wearing a black suit. And so they, there would be thousands of these people, black guys, black suit, you know, huge afro, walking around this world, and they would do things like form a swastika out of themselves. And I think that was a real landmark because it, it was when they were able to see that, you know, they can use their numbers to do something really interesting and really disruptive. So we blocked the entrance to their pool, and that just pissed them off so fucking much. It was fucking beautiful. That was fucking just wonderful, wonderful times. Those kids love that pool. They love the shit out of their pool. The goal was actually to offend everyone, it, simply because the idea that we could offend you by drawing a little shape on the screen was was stupid to the people involved in it. They were like, really, you're going to get that mad over us doing just drawing this on the screen? Wow. Well, you, you need to refocus a little on life because this should not be upsetting you that much.
Barrett Brown, I'm the director of Project PM and uh, former operative with Anonymous. We were targeting furries, which may have registered subculture of people, of course, who, you know, a lot of people on 4chan find irritating by virtue of their being irritating. A furry is someone, generally a male who's autistic in his 20s, who identifies with animals and oftentimes has sexual attraction to other people dressed as animals. There's diaper furs, furs who enjoyed wearing diapers, baby furs who enjoyed thinking themselves as a baby. We had furry infiltrators, people trying, you know, we had secret groups, you know, mine was called the, the Illuminati slash I slash Illuminati, and you know, we were, you know, our goal was to wreak as much havoc as possible, because it was stupid. There was a, was a point, you know, when I was, you know, other, otherwise, you know, seemingly respect, respectable writer, you know, 2007, um, and my first book had come out like that, but I spent my evenings on Second Life, that big, you know, virtual world, riding around in a virtual spaceship with the words faggery daggery do written on it, wearing afros and dropping virtual bombs on little villages and concerts and waving giant penises around. And that was the most fun time I've ever had in my life. All these different organizations online, whether it's 4chan or just any, any website, there's typically a community uh, aspect to it. This is where people have their social uh, relationships. This is where their friends are. This is where they have a creative outlet. And so the, all those aspects are going into groups like Anonymous, where people feel like they're part of a bigger thing and they're able to express themselves within that group. There were certain, uh, certain words, certain phrases, uh, certain ways people respond to things, certain images that were posted that created a pattern. And that pattern was, I guess, the origin of what is now Anonymous. It's like Freemasons with a sense of humor. And so much as they have this common symbology, and, and one of their chief joys, which is kind of wrapped up in power and secrecy, was the fact that they could recognize each other by referencing these symbols, referencing these phrases. Over 9,000. It's over 9,000! I lost my iPod. Mudkips, anything involving mudkips. So you have this weird sort of international culture developing with people you know, across the world, wherever they may be. In late 06 and you know, into early 07, there's a bit of a sea change where instead of just posting a bunch of content or randomly saying we're going to go over to some website and post a bunch of dirty comments against someone, uh, it becomes a little more organized. Welcome to the Hal Turner Show. They went after a guy named Hal Turner. I am being discriminated against because I'm white. Hal Turner was a, was a neo-Nazi who was, you know, big online and had a, like a podcast. I think that the 14th Amendment was not ratified properly, and I think, therefore, it is still okay to have Negroes as slaves in America. The first time I heard about Hal Turner is he was knocking somebody on 4chan. He was just being a major dick to a relatively known user. And for the fun of it, we started trolling him. And then I guess we kind of figured we had a moral high ground, which allowed us to get people on our side. But he was a fucking neo-Nazi. That's not okay to be in modern society. You're not allowed to do that. And there's a million neo-Nazis out there. But he started picking on our dudes, so we had to go to our dude's fucking defense. And it just so happened that he was a neo-Nazi, so that's a bigger reason that he's a fucking dick face. I'm like, yeah, screw that racist son of a bitch. Let's, let's do this, you know? So I joined in and I made some of the phone calls and you know I, I played around on, on the chat thing on his website and posted in the threads and whatnot. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hola, this is Pedro. Spick, from don't San call Diego. Don't call my radio show anymore, you filthy spick animal. Uh, the college that I, I go on the Hal to Turner show. has begun an integration program where they try and purposely lower standards to bring more blacks and quote unquote diversify the campus and by the end of the by the end of uh, the next five years they intend to bring over 9,000. He was just a horribly racist radio personality who seemed to handle it well when you called in like he could handle being berated by Anonymous and that made it very interesting it, it made it a bit of a challenge it wasn't some guy who just either crumbled or stopped answering the phone it was a guy who would yell back. I don't see where really where you're going with this. Where I'm going is I believe Barack Obama is genetically incapable of exercising the power necessary to govern the most complicated nation on earth. That's where I'm going with this. And I think part of the reason he's incapable of doing it is because of racial genetic inferiority.
Is that clear enough for you? No, you changed the subject again. Wait a second, you asked Caltero me... wasn't the first, like, actual person that, you know, Anonymous had caused trouble for, but the circumstances ended up being significant. They DDoSed his, his website, stuff like that, costing him thousands of dollars, bandwidth fees. We DDoSed him, which is overflowing his server with packets and fake information, and then we kind of trolled him in real life. We sent countless pizzas to his house, we signed him up for escorts on Craigslist, we sent a bunch of pallets of uh, you know, industrial materials to his house, which he ultimately had to put the bill for. And basically we destroyed his ability to pay for his radio show, and that took him off the internet. He was super pissed. And, and then they ended up getting some, some real hackers to, to help them out. Like this wasn't sort of pranks, they actually like, were able to get into Hal Turner's private servers. Uh, and his mail servers and you know, find some interesting emails that he was serving as an FBI informant, uh, which, you know, if you're uh, you know, a right-wing neo-Nazi, is not a good thing to be. And obviously him being an FBI informant and also his reaction, his sort of douchebaggy reaction to the raids, uh, damaged his credibility within the white nationalist scene, you know, which is a shame. Hal Turner's gone, he's been prosecuted by the feds for threatening judges. It wasn't supposed to be different, but it ended up being different. People who observe Anonymous see this group called Anonymous going after this white nationalist and say, oh, hey, look, Anonymous must be some kind of activist organization. So by virtue of those people joining Anonymous, Anonymous becomes more of an activist organization. What follows is a period of, of confusion and, and anger in which you know, the original Anonymous people, the sort who want to keep Anonymous as this nihilist little, you know, ridiculous group, you know, are upset that now, you know, that the most terrible thing on the internet is now becoming a force for good all of a sudden.